I really love that music. That brings me right back home. How many people here love astronomy? Raise your hands. Oh, come on. You, raise your hands. Everybody, <laughs> come on. Put your nerd banner up high. Wave it proud. Come on. There we go. Fantastic. I'm an astronomer. I love astronomy. Astronomy is the most exciting of all the sciences. I don't care what the biologists and the geologists tell you, the chemists, but astronomy is the best. I knew I wanted to be an astronomer when I was about five years old. I think one of the benefits of growing up in the farmlands of mid-Missouri is that uh, we get lots of open spaces and pretty dark skies. So I spent much of my youth sitting down underneath the stars at night. And I maintained that passion for astronomy all through high school. And when I graduated, I thought, well, you know, I really want to make this my career. So I decided to attend the University of Missouri, where I majored in physics. Now, even during this time, even though I was doing a pure physics degree, I started getting interested in this field called archaeoastronomy, which looked at how ancient civilizations understood astronomy. And nowadays, we tend to think of it more as cultural astronomy, more of, of ancient cultures and contemporary cultures. But at the time, this really excited me. And I started taking some courses in anthropology and archaeology as an undergrad, and that really sort of solidified my interest. But um, I decided at the end of that that I wanted to do my PhD overseas. And I had spent a semester here at Macquarie University nearby in Sydney, and I loved it. It was the best four months I ever had, so I knew where I was going to go. So I came back to Sydney, and I enrolled at the University of New South Wales to do a PhD in astrophysics. So while I'm sitting on a mountaintop under a telescope looking for planets around the stars, I couldn't help but be drawn back to this cultural aspect of astronomy and the historical aspects. And I decided, you know, I love astrophysics, but cultural astronomy really is my passion. That's really what I want to do. So I decided to finish with a master's degree there, and then I went off to Macquarie University to do a PhD in indigenous studies with a thesis on Aboriginal astronomy. Now, coming from a physics background, jumping into the social sciences was a big challenge. It was a completely different way of thinking. Not to mention, I knew next to nothing about Aboriginal culture or Australian history. And my advisors had rightly told me that if you do a PhD in this field, because it's such a tiny niche area, that your chances of getting a job doing research and teaching in that field are going to be slim to none. But I thought, you know what, this is what I want to do. I'm going to give it a go. And it worked out beautifully, because I was shortly after I finished my PhD hired at the Nirragilly Indigenous Center at the University of New South Wales as an academic. So I'm able to continue my research and teaching in indigenous astronomy. So many of you would be asking, well, what is indigenous astronomy? You keep saying that, but what does it mean? When we think of indigenous culture, we think of oral traditions. We think of songs, stories, and dance. We tend to think of, you know, all oh, other myths and legends. When all reality, they're not just myths and legends. They contain all of the information for that culture that's passed down through the generations over thousands, tens of thousands of years. That includes information about social structure, about laws and customs. It also includes a lot of information about the natural world, what we tend to think of as scientific information. It can be information about land resource management and fire practices, about bush medicines and bush tucker, bush foods. It could relate to weather patterns, climate cycles, calendars, astronomy, everything. So the important thing to remember when it comes to these indigenous stories is they're not just stories. They contain all of that information. And I was in particular interested in the astronomical aspect. So what I want to do is share a few stories about indigenous astronomy with you, and then talk about some things we're doing to get this information out to the public. Now, like I mentioned, this contains a lot of, a lot of information about the culture. It contains a practical aspect, and it contains a social aspect. So the first story I want to tell you about is actually from Arnhem Land, from the Yongyu people. They tell a story about three brothers of the kingfish totem. Now, because the kingfish was the totemic, or the totemic animal, it was the embodiment of their ancestors, and it was absolutely taboo, completely forbidden for them to harm or kill a kingfish. Well, these three brothers were skilled fishermen, and they wanted to go out on a fishing expedition. But the elder men told them that you need to be careful because at this time of the year, clouds can appear, storms can appear suddenly, and they can be deadly. The three brothers said, oh, yeah, well, it looks pretty clear to me. Yeah, we'll be fine. We'll keep an eye out. And they decided to go out far into the sea in their canoe. And as they were out there, they were having a great time catching fish. The problem is all the fish they caught were the kingfish, which they had to turn around and immediately release unharmed. And as the day grew on, they grew very frustrated by this. And as they grew frustrated, they started squabbling with each other over what they were going to do. As they were doing this, they were not paying attention to the sky in the distance where storm clouds were gathering. They decided they were going to pull one last catch of kingfish in 
tied to the boat, and head back to water. And as they did this, the storm clouds started rolling in, and the boys started frantically paddling to get back to shore, because they were pretty far out at sea. Unfortunately for them, Walu, the sun woman, had been watching the entire time, and she was very displeased. The brothers had broken sacred law. So she took these storm clouds and created a whirlwind, which took the three brothers and their canoe up to the sky, where you can see them today. That's a constellation Westerners call Orion. The three stars in Orion's belt represent the three brothers. The stars Betelgeuse and Rigel represent the bow and stern of the canoe. And the scabbard of Orion's sword represents the kingfish tied to a rope trailing behind the canoe, which they called jewel pan. So this story tells us three important things. Number one, it reminds younger generations why it's important to remember and obey sacred laws. Number two, listen to your elders. They have experience. They have knowledge. And number three, if you see Orion rising just after sunset, that's the time of the year that the monsoon season is about to start. So it had a practical and a social aspect. But not all Aboriginal constellations were made up of bright stars. Some of them were made up of the dark spaces in the Milky Way. You can't really see it from the big cities like Sydney or Melbourne, but if you get out to regional areas where you have real dark skies, you can see these dust lanes in the Milky Way, and they're quite beautiful. Now, these could trace out all kinds of animals. They could be crocodiles, the kangaroos. They could be uh, nests of eagles or even a dark cave in which an evil spirit dwells. But one of the most famous examples that you find right across Australia is that of the emu. Now, the emu's head is the coal sack nebula, dark space right next to the Southern Cross. Her neck is traced out down through the pointers, often Beta Centauri, into the center of the galaxy. And once you see the shape of an emu for the first time, you'll never see it the same again. Now, the emu is actually not only found in Australia. If you, well, sorry, the emu design in the sky is not only in Australia. If you go to South America, the indigenous people of northern Bolivia see it as a rhea, a large flightless bird, very similar to an emu or an ostrich. Even the Inca see it as a llama in the sky. But the emu in the sky told a couple of very important things. Number one, it informed when it was time to collect emu eggs. Because when the emu would begin to rise after sunset, late um, April, early May, that was when emus were laying their eggs. But after sunset, when the entire emu was in the sky or feet above the ground, that occurred in early June, it was too late to get eggs in because they started getting chicks in them. So that's the practical aspect. But the social aspect actually related in many parts of Southeast Australia, along New South Wales and Queensland, to male initiation ceremonies, commonly called Bora ceremonies after the Camilla Roy word. This is where young men were brought from boyhood to manhood. And the reason the emu in the sky featured so prominently is because male emus actually help incubate and rear the young. So it was symbolic of the men bringing the boys into manhood. Now, the third example I want to give you is actually from the Torres Strait. The Torres Strait Islanders are actually Melanesian people more closely related to Papuans and Fijians as opposed to Aboriginal Australians, but they are indigenous to Australia. Their entire culture is based on astronomy, particularly the story of Tagai. And the story of Tagai is that he was a fierce warrior and an expert fisherman. He had a crew of 12 men that he called the Zugables, which went out on a fishing expedition with him to the reefs. It was a hot day, and the fish simply were not biting. So Tagai left the boat and went out onto the reef to find more fish, a place where they could bring the boats. These Zugables became bored, they became hot, they became tired. Unfortunately, the only water that was left in the boat belonged to Tagai. And as you might imagine, the Zugables, after a period of time with Tagai being gone, grew hot and frustrated and decided they were going to drink all the water. And when he came back, he was pretty upset. He was so upset, in fact, that he killed all 12 men. He sent them up into the sky. Six became the star cluster we know as the Pleiades, Usium. And the other six became the stars we see in the belt and scabbard of Orion, Uthimal. Tagai himself went to the opposite side of the sky. Now, Tagai constellation is actually very large. His left hand is the Southern Cross. His right hand is Corvus the Crow. And his stars make up his body all the way down to Scorpius. And the, the tail of Scorpius is actually a canoe that he's standing on. So he put them on the opposite side of the sky of him. Now, this is sort of reminiscent of the European story about Orion and the scorpion getting in a fight and the gods putting them on opposite sides of the sky. So again, this informs the people of why it's important to obey laws and traditions. But these 
constellations in the sky also inform people about weather changes and time to plant crops. So when Tagai rises early in the morning, just before sunrise, what astronomers call heliacal rising, you'll be tested on this later, as he rises above the horizon, this signifies that the kuki, or the wet season, will be coming soon, and they need to get prepared by planting crops. So all three of these are examples of how indigenous Australians, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, use astronomy. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. I could stand up here and probably talk for hours on this, and I will if you give me a chance. But the question is, why do we do this? Why is it important? Well, part of it's about understanding our collective heritage. It's about understanding, from an academic perspective, how humans develop scientific knowledge throughout time. But I think one of the really important aspects is that it changes people's perceptions. Every time I give a public talk, inevitably, somebody comes up to me afterwards and goes, I had no idea. I had no idea they had developed all these complex knowledge systems around the stars. And it's fantastic. You can see the light go on. You can hear the click in their mind. Their attitudes are changing for the better. Now, should we be surprised by this? I don't think we should be. I mean, if you imagine uh, people living in this continent for 50 or 60,000 years, you'd expect them to have a pretty good understanding of the natural world around them. But there's a lot of bias in society, and a lot of that is negative, and it's against indigenous knowledge. So by, by doing this kind of research and getting this out there, we're really changing people's perceptions. So the question now is, OK, now we know why we're going to do it. What are some innovative new ways that we can get this information using the latest technology to you? And one of the things we've decided to work on is the Worldwide Telescope. Now, the Worldwide Telescope was developed by Microsoft Research. It's an interactive, free astronomy software package. It's absolutely amazing. It does just about everything that you can imagine. You can take, as you see here on the slide, you can take a tour of all the planets and the asteroids and moons in our solar system. You can study the evolution of stars. You can go into deep space to quasars and galaxies. And it contains all the latest data and knowledge and information from astrophysics and cosmology. You can also put yourself anywhere on the face of the Earth or several other planets at any time and see exactly what's in the sky. But one thing that it's missing is the cultural information. And that's where we come in. So the Neurogilly Indigenous Center at UNSW is working closely with Microsoft Research to incorporate indigenous content into the Worldwide Telescope. So we're creating interactive tours and all kinds of different materials to put in. But what we really need are the indigenous communities themselves to get involved. They need to have a major part in this. So what we're doing is we're developing an interactive sort of Wikipedia type of site where the indigenous communities can go online and they can upload their own sky stories. It can be audio, visual, text, whatever. They are able to share their culture on their terms. And that's very, very important. It empowers them to do that. It builds a repository for their knowledge. And as some of you probably know, a lot of indigenous uh, traditional knowledge is actually secret and sacred. So instead of one of us going out there like me, a white American, and doing some faux pas by putting some sacred indigenous story online, we can assure the indigenous community and the elders and custodians they're taking care of that aspect. They're telling us their stories. They're putting their information on. So by using this interactive software, we can get this information on indigenous astronomy to you and everybody else in the world. And we're empowering the indigenous communities in this aspect, in this respect. And we're also getting students interested and keen on science. All students, including indigenous students, which unfortunately right now remain underrepresented, underrepresented in STEM areas, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, particularly in physics and astronomy. So we're trying to get indigenous students in as well. So there's a lot of different aspects to this project with the Worldwide Telescope. But I see a very bright future ahead for everyone. Thank you.